that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul Methodist Church. It is wonderful to see you here bright and early on this wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements to make you aware of. One is the basement quilters will be over at uh, Liberty Pool tomorrow morning from 9 until sometime. Uh, and you are welcome to join them, bring your quilting, your craft projects. It is a wonderful group to join. Uh, Wednesday Warrior in the food pantry and then next Sunday is Communion Sunday. Uh, as well as it is a fellowship uh, time after our service here uh, next Sunday. Are there any other announcements for the good of the community? All right. Then let's join together in our prayer of preparation. God of covenant, you promised Abraham land, descendants, and blessing, so that he may be a blessing for all. Show us how to honor the covenant so that we might be a blessing to others. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us stand or stand in spirit as we sing our opening hymn, number 64.
Please join me in the call to worship. We are met in the presence of God. And we do not meet alone. With the angels in the highest heaven. We gather to worship the Lord. With Abraham and Sarah. We gather to worship the Lord. With the saints of every age. We gather to worship the Lord. We embark on our own journey of faith. God's, God's holy name be praised. God makes us a great people. God's holy name be praised. In the desert, and in the den, in the burrow, in the basilica. God's holy name be praised. We journey in the presence of God. And we do not journey alone. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you give us our voice, no two the same. As you did with Abraham and Sarah, you take and touch our lives, and they become extraordinary. And in your church, you have gathered us in the community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people. You have called us, and you have given us a place for us. So let us say and do here. What we ponder and decide here, be real for us and honest to you, as you prepare us for the life of the world in which you are praised. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis, starting in chapter 11 and going into chapter 12. Typically, when we talk about the call story of Abraham and Sarah, we typically just start in verse or in chapter 12, but I think it's interesting when we go back and hear what the rest of verse or uh, chapter 11 has to say about Abram's family. So let us listen for a word from God. <clears throat> this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahar, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in the Ur of Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nabar both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahar's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. And Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, with his, uh, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from the Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came on Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make you a great I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on, a, on toward the hills set a Bethel and pitched his tent there. With Bethel on his west and Ai on his east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called it the name of the Lord. Then Abram set, Abram set out and continued towards Negev. <laughs>
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Bicycling has been one of my favorite things since I was a very little kid. I enjoyed the freedom that came from it. I enjoyed going out on the roads or through the trails. My brother and I, on the property that we had for a while, made mountain biking trails through the wooded areas, right past my dad, deer blind, which I'm sure he appreciated. We didn't ride during deer season, we knew better than that. But I like to ride, I like to get out and into those moments. And as runners and cyclists and other people know, it's sometimes just more fun when you're in a group. So when we were living in northern Michigan, uh, there was all sorts of kind of rides that happened around us. And northern Michigan actually here reminds me of there, or there reminds me of here, however you want to phrase that. But there are big kind of rolling hills and especially some steeper climbs, especially when you come from the Mississippi back east and you climb, I don't know, 14,000 vertical feet to get to the top of the hill, is that correct? <laughs> no sarcasm. <laughs> I'll try the joke at the next two churches and just see if it gets better. <laughs> Probably not though. But there were these beautiful rides, and so I signed up for one that took us out and we got to ride past Lake Michigan for a while, and then you turned inward to these hills, and you went up and down these hills, and they called it Mountain Mayhem, this ride. And I had trained a lot that winter. I had spent hours sitting on my bike in my house, watching the little wheel in the back spin around, the front wheel not move at all, and getting off and always knowing that my butt was going to hurt. But I thought I was ready for this ride. I had some friends that said they were going to sign up for the race with me. But as it got closer, each one dropped out one by one until it was just finally me who was going to go do this ride. I decided I was going to do it anyways, and so I uh, got up, I drove a few miles to get to where I needed to, signed up for the race, or signed uh, in, and then I took off on my 60 mile loop that I was supposed to complete. I knew I could make it because I had been training quite a bit, but the first part of the race was the easy part. You started off by the lake, and much like being next to the Mississippi River, it's relatively flat. But that second half, you turn inward and start climbing up and down these little hills, or well, rather bigger hills, that we had inside. And as I was going along and I was doing what I needed to do, I came to the first challenging hill and I made it up and over the top. And then I got to the bottom and I did look up this hill that was probably actually about 300 feet uh, vertically up over the next quarter mile or so. It was a doozy of a climb. And so I switched into what we, in the bike uh, cyclist community, we call the granny gear. It is the one where you spin your legs the fastest, but your back tire does not move all that much, but allows you to do those climbs. And so I switched into that gear, and I rose out of the saddle, and just then my rear derailleur in the back swung in towards my tire, or my wheel, catching a bunch of spokes and grinding me to the halt on the side of this hill. I had taken out four or five spokes on my wheel, took it out of true. There was no way I was continuing like that. Luckily on this race or this ride, they had vehicles that came along every so often to make sure the cyclists were still doing okay. And these vehicles came up, they saw me sitting on the side of the road with my, car, or with my bike, and they picked me up and said, where can I take you? You want to go back into town? And I said, sure, let's go see if I can fix my tire and finish this ride. I got into the bike shop in town and I wasn't the only one to have a mechanical issue that day. I talked to them for a few minutes and realized they were not getting to my bike anytime soon. I called my wife and asked her to come with our newborn child to come pick me up so I could come home from this race. I had to call it a day about halfway through my trip. I was excited to make it all the way through, to get to where I was going, to go on this journey. But then there was just something in the way. Something along the journey that was the hiccup that stopped me that I didn't make it all the way. Now I've gone out and I've done 60 miles rides since then and longer. But that day I didn't make it to where I was hoping to go. 
In our reading today, we find a family who sets off on a journey at first. They leave the Ur of the Chaldeans, and they're headed towards Canaan. But this is Terah. This is Abraham's father who starts this journey. They get about halfway around the Fertile Crescent from the Ur of the Chaldeans going down into Canaan. They get to Haran, and they stop there. For whatever reason, Terah decides to set up shop in that place. But notice, though, in verses, the early verses of chapter 11, Terah meant to go all the way to Canaan, but yet he stops in that moment. We don't know why. We don't know what was going on with him. Why was it that he only got halfway there, and that's where he stopped, even though he set out to go the entire way? Some scholars seem to think that God actually maybe first called Terah to go and to be this family. And when Terah didn't follow all the way through, God moved on to Abraham to complete this faith journey. But whatever the reason was, there was something that happened in Abram's family. Where he was supposed to go all the way to Canaan originally, they got about part way and it stopped. But then we begin the story with Abraham. Someone's name that we come and we talk about all the time. We talk about the fathers and mothers of our faith. We talk about Abraham and Sarah. We talk about uh, Isaac and Jacob and down the line. And Abraham comes and he hears the call of God. To uproot his family once again and move to a different place. To go and finish this calling to make it to the land of the Canaanites. His life for Abraham is a journey. One where he doesn't even see the final destination, even during this passage. He says, look around you. This land I will give to your children. He doesn't even say to Abraham himself. But can you imagine being Abraham? back with his family. Back in moments where he's trying to figure out what to do, and he's hearing this call to step out and do something. But sometimes that first step is the hardest part. We don't know. We know we need to get the ball rolling, but sometimes we're just not quite sure what it means, how to get there, or how to take that first step. I'm not sure why, but when my family plans on going on a trip, we can have planned for months, been packing for a week, staging bags by the door the night before, but when it comes actual time to go and get into the car, we will have a million things that will need to be found, filled, or foraged before we can leave. Stop looking at your partners. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Abram gets to the place where he does step out. He hears this call from God that he is called to be this amazing place and steps into this covenant with God. We call this the Abrahamic covenant, this place where God steps in and takes on the responsibility of what it means for this relationship. Another passage that I don't think I'll have time to, to even get to as one to preach on here, so I want to bring it up now. Is later on, as God is making this covenant more fully with Abraham, there's this moment in a way of doing covenants in the ancient world, where you bring in the animals that were to be sacrificed to make this covenant, and you would cut them in half, and you would lay them out in two strips on either side. And then the two people that were making the covenant together would grab each other's hands, or thighs actually, was part of their kind of uh, covenantal moment in that day, and they would walk through it together, basically reciting a prayer that said, "May if either one of us break this covenant, may what will happen to these animals happen to us. And so there's this moment where Abraham and God are entering into this covenant together. And Abraham brings the animals and slaughters them and put them on either side, 
And then God knocks Abraham out and walks through himself, telling us that God is taking on the full responsibility of this covenant. That God is claiming these people as his own, his dearly beloved, and that no matter what will come, God will take on the responsibilities of making sure this covenant stays fully intact. See, God's way of covenanting with us is one where he gives all so that we can be in relationship with him and with each other, with ourselves, and with the world. It's almost like when somebody was to invite you to go on vacation to a really expensive resort, and you go, I don't know if I can, and then they begin telling you, I'll pay the airfare, I'll pay the resort fee, I'll buy all the meals, the drinks, the shows, the excursions, the whole package. All you have to do is make it to the plane. It's basically what God does with Abraham. Just show up. And then showing up, I have these great, beautiful blessings for you. So Abraham does leave. And God begins to tell him about what he's promising him. There's four parts to the Abrahamic promise. First is this place. God doesn't fully explain here the geographic region that is going to be his descendants, but Abraham knows they're going to have this land that used to belong to the Canaanites. And this place is at the crossroads, crossroads of the world at the time. People who are trading from north to south or east to west are going to go through this land at some point. So God is putting God's people right in the middle of everything that's happening in the known world at the time. Second, God promises Abraham that he is going to be the father of a great nation. And this man who is childless, childless, who is in his 70s already, he's going to have so many descendants that are going to be as numerous as the stars. And this one was going to take some time to get to. There was going to be a blessing that they were going to wait for to see fulfilled. And the great nation doesn't come for some time. But then God tells them, I'm going to give you privilege. That I'm going to bless you. Out of all the people on the earth, God's people, Abraham's descendants, were going to be ones that are going to be blessed beyond measure. And if anybody blesses them, they will be blessed. And if anybody curses them, they will be cursed. But God is going to hold them in a special place. But not just for themselves. The reason God is going to bless them is that say, they can be a blessing to the rest of the world. Where they can come in and see those in need who are hunger, hungry, hungry and thirsty. And they can come in and feel that love. So God has something for each of us. There are times that we hear the call and we hear the call well. And other times, it's hard for us to make the call out over all the noise in the world. There are times when we're attuned to what God is saying in our lives and in our church. And other times, the noise of our lives, the noise of the world, the noise of all that's happening, grabs our attention. And I believe God is often calling us to be on this journey of faith. Sometimes the literal journey of one of finding a new place and a new home. Other times the metaphorical one, coming to a new understanding of our place in the world and what God has for us. And the journeys, they often change us. The journey has created us people who are the people that we're supposed to be. And though we do sometimes arrive at the destination, it's often the journey that is the one that helps us grow and become the person we are called to be. But to start the journey, we must hear the voice of God, to hear that call in our lives. We need to be attuned to God's voice in our lives each and every day, spending quiet moments, listening, spending time praying and reading scripture to come closer to those moments of hearing God's voice in our lives. There are many circumstances that keep us from getting the places that God has called us to. Sometimes it's the circumstances that have happened to us. Sometimes the circumstances that we cause our own selves. And it's sometimes just the crummy circumstances of this fallen world. 
But whatever the circumstances, God said that God is going to going to do to accomplish God's goals. All we have to do is set out. But sometimes there are things that are just holding us back. I do always wonder why Terah never made it to Canaan. It was his goal. He said, I want to go from here, the Urukadians, over to Canaan. But he literally got halfway there and decided not to. We don't know why. Many scholars, especially Jewish scholars, have debated this and had conversations about it for many, many thousands of years. And there's moments that we've tried to figure out what does it mean to step out past our past and into something new. And one of the mitzvahs, which is the teachings for Jewish folks around the scripture, they tell this story. Abraham's father, Terah, was an idol manufacturer. Once he had traveled, so he left Abram to manage the shop. People would come in and ask to buy idols, and Abram would answer, or ask, how old are you? The person would say 50 or 60. And Abram would say, isn't it pathetic that a man of 60 wants to bow down to a one-day-old idol? The man would feel ashamed and leave. One time a woman came in with a basket of bread. She said to Abram, take this and offer it to the gods. Abram got up, took a hammer in his hand and broke all the idols into pieces and then put the hammer in the hand of the biggest idol among them. When his father came back and saw all the broken idols, he was appalled. Who did this, he cried. How can I hide anything from you? replied Abram calmly. A woman came in with a basket of bread and told me to offer it to them. I brought it in front of them, and each one said, I'm going to eat first. Then the biggest one got up, took a hammer, and broke all the others into pieces. What are you trying to pull on me? asked Tara. Do, you have, uh, do they have minds? Abram said, listen to the words your own mouth is saying. They have no power at all. Why worship the idols? I love the story. Extra biblical as it is, coming to this understanding that sometimes our past is holding us back. Our past is holding us from going and getting to the place where God is calling us to. And Abram has seen that. He's seen his father take off from the land of Ur of Chaldeans, get halfway there, to where he was going and stop. And Abram hearing the call of God and finishing the task and getting to where he was called to be. As we are called in our, fam or our journey of faith, are we willing to step out past our past? Step out past what your family maybe thought your calling was and into what God is calling you to do. Are you feeling... Uh, are you able to continually hear God's voice, even when it calls us into the unknown? Sometimes there are things that do hold us back from moving on to the new future that God has for us. And then I think about you all as a church, as a driftless ministry. Are you ready to move into this new, new future that God is calling you to? To see all the beautiful things that God has planned for the growth of these three churches in this area. To feel the power of the Spirit continuously moving through you to minister to the lives of those around you. To be blessed so that you can be a blessing to the rest of the world. Be ready to hear God's call and move into these new beautiful ways of understanding what God is calling us to next. But sometimes stepping out is the hardest part. Sometimes we get halfway there, something calls us back to quit. And sometimes we're almost there and we want to turn around. But let's listen for God's voice. Let's continuously live into God's love so that we can share God's love with our neighbors. Amen. <laughs>
time in our service where we lift before one another and our God our prayers of praise and our prayers of concern. Who do we have to pray for today? Keep in mind all those kind of west of us who dealt with tornadoes over the last few days. Yes. Prayers for safe travels for Gary and Carl as they go on their Freedom Honor flight next weekend. Gary and Carl. Carl. Sorry. Started writing. Both things were working at the same time. <laughs> Ears and fingers, not at the same time sometimes. Gary and Charlie. Phyllis Garda, who lost her sister in law this week. Abraham's vintage people, the nation of Israel, and the Jewish nation with the turmoil of war that they continue to be involved. Keep Israel and Gaza in their prayers. And also lifting up Pete this week. I know it's a big week. Thank you. Prayers for you. Let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Gracious and loving God, as we enjoy the rain that is coming down, as we know that it nourishes the ground so that the plants can grow, so the cows and other livestock can be fed, uh, Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, we recognize that there are times, so many times, so many places on this earth without the needed water uh, to sustain life. And Lord, we are grateful to be around it in abundance. But we also recognize there are times that there's not quite enough where we need it uh, for our farmers to grow the crops that they need to. And so Lord, we think of the farmers. I think of those who are planting and being getting ready to plant uh, this spring. Lord, we go with them in the hope of a wonderful harvest uh, that was to come. Lord, we lift before you our friends who are in need. We lift before you Charlie and Debbie. We lift before you Phyllis in their time of grief. We ask you to be with Pete throughout this week. We ask for travel, safe travels for Gary and Carl. Lord, we think of our neighbors to the west who have dealt with tornadoes over the last few days. Lord, as people began to pick up their lives and uh, find a new way forward, we ask for your blessing to be upon them. Lord, we think of the places in this world where war continues to rage. We think of Israel and Gaza. We think of the Ukraine. We think of the other places in our world where there is unrest and people are just longing for moments of peace. And so Lord, today as your gathered people, we come asking for your guidance, asking for you to move in, uh, in our lives so that we can feel your presence, that we can be a blessing to those around us. And so Lord, remind us of our call, remind us of why you have placed us here, as we pray the prayer, your Son continues to teach us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So stay and stand in the spirit as we sing our ascending hymn, Blessed Assurance.
God, your co-heirs with Christ, you who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's go forth this place, know that we are on our journey, called by God to go throughout this world, to share our love with one another. Let us go in peace and do that. Amen. Thank you.